spoke these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or the, the waters below. You will not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to the thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son nor daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in the, your towns. For six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that they may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Do You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife nor, or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. This in this, the scripture reading today. I have to apologize to Lee for having to read 20 verses. So <laughs> Lee, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, 
the world ended on December 21st, 2012. That might be news to you, it was to me. Uh, but once again, we avoided a long prophesized disaster. I don't know how we do it. We seem to avoid these prophecies left and right. There are tons of doomsday prophecies out there, but this one got serious attention. They even made a big old movie about it with John Cusack. But according to the legend, December 21st, 2012 coincided with the end of the Mayan calendar, which was going to trigger a massive apocalypse. Many different theories emerged about how that was going to happen. Some believe the gravitational effects of an alignment between the sun and a massive super black hole would rip the earth apart. Some believe the earth's magnetic poles would suddenly be reversed, releasing energy equal to 100 billion atomic bombs. Some believe that the mysterious planet Nibiru would come crashing into our own. Needless to say, none of those things happen. But end of the world hypotheses are a dime a dozen. Everyone from Pat Robertson to Pope Innocent III, way back in 1284, has predicted the Earth's demise. Even Sir Isaac Newton, that Sir Isaac Newton, predicted the end of the Earth would happen in the year 2060. And he based his prediction on biblical scripture. The end of the world has significance for Christians because it's linked to the return of Christ. Some believe that prior to Jesus' return, God's chosen people are going to be taken up in a event called the rapture, where literally people will simply disappear. I'm going to share with you a cute funny cartoon about that. Um, so the idea is that there would be this event and suddenly all of us would disappear who believed. Well, there was a group um, called Eternal Earthbound Pets USA. They were, uh, they were a loving group of atheists who, for a small fee of $135 to cover travel expenses, would take care of your pet in case of rapture. You know, in case God doesn't take pets. You could rest easy knowing that your pet will be taken care of by a loving atheist. Now, whether you believe in end of the world prophecies or not, they do make us think about two things. Where will you go? And how do you know? Where will you go? And how do you know? That was a quote that Andy Stanley had brought up in one of his sermons. So where will you go when you die and how do you know you're going there? We don't like to think about death. Maybe it's because we're afraid. Maybe it's because we don't really know the answer. But those are two of the most important questions that we can ask because it helps to shape how we live our life. Both this one and in the one hereafter. It can also be that we don't think about it much because we're kind of confident about where we're going to go. There was an ABC poll back in 2005, and about 89% of people at the time believed that good believed in heaven, and 85% believed that's where they were going. That's a lot of people who who are pretty sure they were going to heaven. Why are they so sure? I think it's tied to that belief that good people go to heaven. And most people think they're good. To be honest, it's a premise that makes sense. I mean, if you live a good life and you do good things, then surely you earned a spot, right? We tend to believe that rule applies to pretty much everyone, whether they're Christian or not. We figure good's good no matter what your religion, and God knows that. There are some problems with that assumption. First of all, how good is good enough? How good is good enough? 
That's a question Andy Stanley asked in his book of the same title. How good's good enough? What level do we need to achieve to make it to heaven? You know, where's where's a cutoff? Believe it or not, God doesn't tell us. You think for something as important as this, God would have told somebody. God would have had us write it down. God would have put it somewhere. But nowhere does God tell us what qualifies as good enough. Now in our heads, we have a sort of cosmic balance sheet going with a running total of good things we've done versus bad things we've done. And feel that as long as we're in the plus column, we're probably okay. But is that true? I mean, think about it in grade school, right? If you got 51%, that was a fail. You know? You had to get at least seven. So maybe maybe the bar is 7%. If you're 70% good, then maybe you, you pass. Or maybe God has a bell curve, right? Because being good is so hard that maybe there's a curve and God just has like some sort of cutoff points. Well, sorry, Bob, you know, you're, the cutoff was 59% and you are at 58 When you take a test of the DMV, you know they're not letting you get behind the wheel with a score lower than 70. And considering how bad some drivers are on the road, maybe they should raise that score. Seems 70 is a bit lax, but at least you know. And surely God's more fair than the DMV. But he doesn't tell us how good we have to be. Some would argue that God gives an internal barometer of right and wrong, and we can determine how good we are by using that barometer. But I got to ask you, how reliable is it? How reliable is your internal barometer? Some things are pretty obvious. Everyone knows that it's wrong to cheat or steal or lie or kill. And God made those things pretty clear, right? Lee read read some of the, the 10 biggies for us today. We'd argue that some of these things are transcend cultural boundaries, that we all instinctively know what's right and wrong. But do they? Are there times when you lie to save someone's feelings? Is that really a mortal sin? We don't seem to have any problem killing animals for food. At least, not a lot of us. But in some cultures, they eat animals that we would never think of eating, like dogs. Right? I cannot imagine killing my dog for food. But in some cultures, that's totally acceptable. Is it OK to kill an animal, kill and raise an animal just for food? Well, of course. Right? We killed cows and chickens and, and tons of other animals. Our perceptions of right and wrong don't just differ culturally, but differ over time. We've labeled everything from being a woman to being dark skinned to being left handed as bad, evil, or wrong at some point. In the 2,000 plus years of Christianity, it's only been the last 50 or so that interracial marriage was given an okay by the church. Up until then, it was not all right to be of different races. When I was living in Georgia, um, I had a friend, John, who mentioned he didn't go to church anymore. And it was the word anymore that really piqued my attention. So I asked him about it and, and he looked at me and he, he there's a mixed race couple just uh, sitting like a little bit away from us. And he said, you know, if those two people came up to you and asked you to marry them, you know, would you do it? I told him, yeah, of course. I mean, as long as they love each other and, and all that, then why wouldn't I? And then he told me this story. He told me that he had a friend who was black and 
who wanted to marry a woman who was white. And they went to her pastor to ask for him to perform the wedding ceremony. And he said he wouldn't because their marriage was an abomination before God. Can you believe that? I mean, can you believe that? Can you believe people still think like that in the 21st century? But they do. Not only do they think that, that they would feel totally justified in being judgmental about it and saying something like that to two people who want to be blessed in front of God. That their marriage was an abomination just because they had different skin colors. I thank God we didn't have anybody like that around when Cassie and I got married. But this is something that happened just not that long ago. So how reliable is our internal barometer? You might say, well, at least we can rely on the Bible to tell us what God considers good. We're going to look at that standard today. So if you do have a Bible and you want to follow along, we're going to read from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 3, beginning with verse 9. Romans 3, beginning with verse 9. Now, in this letter, Paul addresses a perception among Jewish Christians that they're somehow a, a step up over the Gentiles because of their heritage. Paul's going to bring them back down to earth pretty quick. He tells them because they are Jewish, not only do they not have a step up, but they have a greater responsibility toward the law than Gentiles. He tells them just because by birth they are part of God's chosen people does not make them any different than Gentiles who have accepted Christ, that both are equally righteous. And that's what we're going to pick up in our reading today. So again, if you have a Bible, or if you want to look it up and read along on your computer, we're going to hear from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 3, verses 9 through 18. So hear now the word of God. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all, for we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Word of God for the people of God, and the people said, thanks be to God. Really gets you, right? There's no one righteous, not even one. Not Jewish or Roman or Greek, not Mother Teresa, not Billy Graham, not the Pope. Paul's trying to impress upon us that we're all flawed, that we all sin, that none of us can escape that fact. At one time or another, each of us has done something that would disappoint God. And that something drives a wedge between us and our relationship. Now you might think, yeah, but I've never done anything that bad. I mean, sure, I'm not perfect, but I'm not like Hitler or anything. But that is God's standard, perfection. Jesus tells us that himself in the Sermon on the Mount. When in Matthew 5, verse 40, he says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That's why no one can live up to the standard that good people go to heaven. Because the standard is just too tough. So how do we know? Where do we go and how do we know? How good is good enough? 
And if you can't tell from God's word, if you can't use your internal barometer and God doesn't have it anywhere in the Bible, then how do you know if you're good enough? And that's what's going to challenge us today. So I'm going to ask you to pray about this week. Despite all the predictions, the world isn't likely to end anytime soon. But it's a good idea to keep those questions in mind. Where do you go? And how do you know? As we talked about today, the assumption good people go to heaven has some flaws. So what can we believe in then? Here's something Andy Stanley wrote in his book. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. We're going to talk about that more in the next couple of weeks. But for today, it's good enough for us to come to the realization that no matter how good we are, we're not perfect. That we all fall short. We all need forgiveness. So at times when your fellow human being makes mistakes, just remember that we've all been in that boat. We're all likely to be in that boat again. Thankfully, we worship a forgiving God who gives us hope in Christ for something more than this life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, well, everyone, I'm going to turn things over now to Greg, uh, who's going to introduce our final song of the morning. Um, Greg, I'm excited to hear what we're going to listen to. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor Craig. And I just want to thank everybody that participated in today's worship service, uh, Lee for being our leader, and Kathy and Vicki, uh, Steph uh, for providing music, and uh, Tack especially for the work that he did on our closing song, and Jill, of course, for all of the things that she does to help our worship go as smoothly as it does. So our closing song is Take Me As I Am, and it's one that was um, brought to us from the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir, very famous uh, gospel choir back east. And uh, it is really, I think, um, it's kind of a it's kind of a plea for God to accept us as we are, but knowing that everybody is equally on the same same basis as far as you know, we we all have things that we regret and um, the realiz the realization that we have all sinned, and yet God is a forgiving God, and as Craig reminded us that you know we we can't be perfect. Uh, and that uh, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. So we are really happy to be able to bring you Naomi Akagi Mascarenas and your choir singing Take Me As I Am. <laughs>
really beautiful. Uh, thank you to Naomi and the choir. Um, thank you so much to uh, Naomi Sanchez too for coordinating all that and putting it all together. Um, and of course, thank you to my compatriots this morning. Uh, both, uh, sorry, <laughs> thank you to both Lee and Greg for helping, helping out and just being part of worship. But most especially thanks to all of you who have joined us together today. Um, it's always something that really warms my heart to see our church community come together um, as we share and celebrate God and God's presence in our lives. So as we leave um, this meeting together today, let's go forth into the world with the joy of Christ in our hearts. Let us show love to the world and when people make mistakes toward us this week, let's remember with a forgiving heart that we too need forgiveness. In the name of Jesus Christ, we come together today. Amen. <laughs>